Thank you. Um, welcome to the webinar, Bali Tourism, The Way Back by Delivering Age of Communications and C9 Hotel Works together with Haworth, HTL and Bali Hotels Association. Welcome. Um, this is the sixth in the series of destination recovery webinars that we've been running. Um, we've been in Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Maldives, last week with Sri Lanka, and today is Bali, one of the most iconic destinations in the world, um, which is fantastic. I'm David Johnson, the CEO of Delivering Age Communications, and I'm your moderator today. Just before we get going, a few housekeeping points. There's a Q&A function right at the bottom of your screen. Please ask questions as we go, and we will get to that at the end, at the end of the presentations. Um, the session is going to be about an hour, hour and 10 minutes. It's going to be recorded and all presentations and the recording will be sent to you as a link automatically right after the session. Okay, right, let's get going. Um, we've got a packed lineup of speakers and we're going to be going through everything from destination to airlines to finance, hotels even, sustainability and markets, the specific markets um, from domestic Australia uh, to China. Right, I'm going to introduce you to our first, our first guest, STR's Jesper Palmquist, who is the Area Director, Asia Pacific. Jesper, over to you, please. Thank you, David. Hopefully you can see uh, the first slide and hear me okay, check. Clearly, thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon from Singapore. Thanks everyone for joining. I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Now, what I will do today a little bit is basically look at science because everyone on this panel and throughout, you look at what's the latest in terms of the control of the virus, what are the restrictions, what are the movements, what are the flights coming and are there any business on the books? But we also look at history to compare with and to study that recovery. What are the most important recovery factors for Bali? They're not the same everywhere and certainly not around the ASEAN. Coming out of this crisis, I think we will see more variations than normally, and it's very really important to be nimble and creative. Like Bali has a history of being one of the most creative hubs in the world, so hopefully this extends also to hospitality. So owners and operators needs to be on the toes, and the point that I'll make later, arguably more for this market than some others. So just briefly on how did we get here and where are we in terms of performance for Bali. Just in the last few years, You'll see to the right, hopefully, some bars of occupancy by quarter in the last few years, and it's pretty okay. So you, you might say that, oh, is that declining a bit? But you have to remember in the last few years, that has been going upwards. It's been an upwards trend to new record levels in some months throughout these days uh, as well. And the fourth quarter looks like, wow, that's really steaming ahead. But that fourth quarter was uh, just coming back after the volcano eruption a few years ago, but also a little bit beyond that. So occupancy coming up, to a pretty good place historically. And it's a similar story with average daily rate. A few years ago, we saw pressure on rates in Bali, that let go. And then since then, we've seen rates climb to new heights and actually some, some new record levels again throughout some months. So we come into this crisis with good performance, mainly in, in, in a variety of domestic and global brands and around the country or, and in around the island as well. What about the bigger picture? So this heat map shows Bali over 20 years, right? From 2000 to now. And you can see that green kind of line in the middle that I've highlighted. That's the seasonality, of course, everyone knows. You got Q3 that runs that. So what have we gone through? Because it's interesting when you compare it to other competitors to Bali in the region. Yes, terror tax followed by SARS back then. That's 12 to 18 months of more yellow and amber color. Then again, obviously the terror tax, 12 to 18 months. But then it's nice to see that no news is good news because that area there where it remains green, that's the global financial crisis, which didn't really affect Australians. And in, in Bali, you saw an uptick of stronger occupancy. But there's a softening in this period in 2014 and 15. So what was that about? Well, that was about supply. So those of you who are in Bali or, or put that, it was not about a, a volcano, but it was an invasion by developers and money to put a lot of rooms in Bali. So about a 9% increase in new rooms over existing supply came around 2013, 14, and obviously that set pressure uh, in the next couple of years. But it came back. But speaking of volcanoes, then of course it was the eruption, the next little orange blip, and then it's no longer orange, it's completely red because of COVID. So it's interesting when I look at this heat map because I compare it to other markets, it's fewer kind of disruptions, 
But the problem for Bali is, of course, it's very diverse, just like Bali, because you had, you know, viral, you had terror, you had natural disasters, all of it. But Bali has managed that quite well. And if you didn't know, this is like nothing else, even back in 2002, 2003, when we we're down in the low teens, now obviously with everything shut and hotels forced to shut, not my government, but just zero demand, we're down to zero to 5% occupancy as well. Now, I talked about supply and how that affects in the past. This will take time, I will say about three or four times in these few minutes, and it will in the future as well because of this new supply. If I look at new keys coming to Bali in the next 18 to 24 months, so end of 21, it's almost about 5% of new rooms. Some projects have already been deferred, some are delayed, and we could see more of that, but it's still not insignificant. And that will slow down, of course, a recovery into that. So then you look at the international arrivals. Australia and China has already said, highly unlikely to travel outside international in 2020. So cross fingers for 21, right? So more on that to follow later in this webinar. So that leaves us with domestic. So here's the map of Bali. Yes, this is the map of Bali. It looks weird, but this is the map of Bali to about 99% of the people who go there because they ignore the wonderful white space that people hopefully after this crisis start seeing as well. So who and where has domestic demand now that we're only talking about domestic and then potentially a head start from the third quarter onwards. And these factors down there kind of play in. So if you broadly speaking with some exceptions, you have upper mid scale hotel and below, uh, you could be independent or in a smaller brand, maybe around that what we say KLS, so Kuta Legion and, and Seminyak, you see a majority of your guests from within Indonesia already. That could give an early edge and find some rooms uh, directly, right? During Q3, Q4, maybe even this year, right? So some of those hotels have 80, 90% domestic business. But if you're in Ubud or Sanor, traditionally not too popular domestically or in a high-end international brand, you rely on international guests, it would take longer. But this shifts competition. So larger and global brands with muscle potentially to market more domestically to attract that and you need that because the return time frame for that overwhelming part of their client base is still unknown. And it's very guesstimated today when it comes back. And I know Kutan Seminyak obviously has a lot of international guests as well. And other nuances exist, right? If you have meeting facilities, you can attract meeting business in Bali in the, in the next year as well, regardless of this. But this is a broad assessment of what we know from the past. If you look at the August reboot, now pending success of July, and virus, et cetera. It will put pressure on the Bali hotels and their ability to adjust and attract as much as possible from that domestic in the short to medium term. Nothing is really normal right now. And for some time, the competition, competition will not be normal either. There's a risk of the price wars, of course, and OTAs is gonna be grabbing for attention. And this is not easy, I get that for hotels, because you're dealing with introduction of new measurements, social distancing, health screening, regulations, F&B, and on social distancing, it's inherently easier for some hotels. So it will be used as a selling point. And, and you're competing with private villas in Bali, of course, which is a bit unique, particularly the smaller ones. They will be popular with that uh, social distancing aspect. So recovery from this will be longer. So please remember, when I look at all the historical, you had a lot of events in Bali, this will take the longest you've ever seen without a doubt. It will start with occupancy. It's a race for demand now. Then you'll start seeing some ADR and heaven knows when, but then some profitability back. And never mind the 2019, 18, 70 levels, please just forget it, tell your owner, tell your operator, that's not the benchmark now, no one should compare with it. Once things reopen, the demand is different. You look a new game plan entirely. What's the occupancy for Bali total annual for this year? If it's over 30%, surprise. 2021, if it's over 50%, I'll be very impressed. Those are the new norm levels for the next couple of years. What I do think you can take solace in is a very important path, a fact. People love Bali. Indonesians, Asians, Aussies, everyone, right? So people will return and Bali would be on top of mind quite early. And that will prove a very important part in, in Bali. It's not a new market, it's very established, et cetera, with early. On that note, I will hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, but thank you. Um... Goodness, no international, the prospect of no international business in 2020. Um, that's certainly um, uh, um, pushing domestic into, into the forefront like, like never before. Um, we're going to talk to two pioneers next, we're, um, two pioneering women actually. 
Um, and we're going to talk to them about what's next. I'd really like to welcome Emily Subrata, who's the director of Sudamala Resorts, and Lucien Anna, who is the co-owner and managing director of Tugu Hotels and Resorts. Ladies, welcome. Hi, David. You need to unmute. To Perfect. Thank you. Um, Emily, I'm going to start with you. How are things on the ground at the moment? What is the situation? Um, okay, so for us, just at the end of March, um, uh, just after Nyapi or the Balinese New Year, the Silent Day, we decided to close our four resorts, um, two in Bali, in Sana and Ahmed, um, one in Lombok and one in Saraya Kachil Island in the Komodos Labuan Bajo. Um, we've continued to slowly prepare for the pre-opening of our upcoming Labuan Bajo Resort, which is to be our fifth resort. Um, and the decision to close the properties was one of the, if not the single toughest decision we have ever made. Um, but our main driving force was to protect the health and safety of the Sudamala family by drastically reducing exposure um, to health risks. So I stand by this decision. Um, and my father and I have been adamant in retaining as much of our team as possible. Um, this is again a really tough decision for us from a financial aspect, um, especially since we originally expected recovery in May and then July. Um, but from the stance of the company philosophy, this was the easiest decision. Mm, thanks, um, uh, Lucy. Lucy um, would would you um, uh, would you would you share some of those views? How things uh, for you? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we we sort of keep. Um, in the past month, we keep the hotels open a la carte. We have a lot of repeater guests who are, love to get out from their lockdowns um, at Tugu Bali. And Tugu Lombok is a bit more complicated because uh, entering Lombok now is a lot more possible, but leaving, coming back to Bali, you still need a swap PCR test. Um, so yeah, most of the rooms are still closed. We opened the restaurants in about a month ago in G in the rooftop. Uh, of course, with all the social distancing protocols, um, rigorous disinfectant, so on and so forth. And yes, uh, Tugu is a family business, as you know, David. So uh, our, our employees are our core family. So we try to keep as many of them as possible for as long as we can. Um, of course, everybody's taking a cut. There is partial uh, unpaid leave and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we can retain everybody until this started to recover. What do you think about some of them, uh, um, some of the comments and um, uh, the hypothesis that, that Jesper was, was coming up with earlier in terms of the domestic market? Um, you know, if, if international is not going to return um, this, this, this year, it's going to be a, you know, a serious focus on domestic. And um, I suppose the question is, is domestic enough? Is it enough for you to kickstart your business? Yeah, uh, it depends. For, well, obviously, we're talking about the Bali tourism. So I'll just talk about Tutugu in Bali. Um, so... It, we only have a small inventory of rooms. Uh, I think it will be quite challenging to rely only on the domestic market for a while. Um, I think bigger hotels who um, have a bigger inventory can probably do heavy discounts to attract domestic markets. Uh, and maybe with the volume, it will cover the cost. But for small inventory such as ours, it doesn't make so much sense, of course, with all the operational costs and maintaining the level of luxury. Um, so yeah, and I think I believe that the one and only plan is to work very closely with the government and communicate that we have things under control as fast as possible and that we have a consistent plan and right. uh, consistent implementation on, on this so we can get back in the safe destination list of every other country. What do you think about that, Emily? I mean, do you, is, the, is the domestic market going to be enough for you? Um, you know, I know, I know typically um, uh, your, your, your guests are from international markets from all over the world. That's right. Um, in short, David, I don't believe so. Um, those who traditionally do well with domestic demand um, will still suffer because the size of the overall pie has shrunken tremendously. Um, yet the number of businesses wanting and needing a slice of that pie has vastly increased. Um, I think like Lucien, our number of inventory is also quite small. In Sanur, we're 34 rooms and in Ahmed, we are eight rooms. Um, but those are not traditionally, uh, like Jesper said earlier, those are not traditionally domestic destinations. Um, so uh, it, it's really interesting because the Sanur hotels uh, have always been quite close to each other and we um, we we 
try to make some strategic destinations as a sorry strategic decisions as to how we can promote center as a destination to um right. to our domestic <clears throat> market um so we'll see what what we can come up with um okay <laughs> good, good luck with that i mean i mean because it's um, uh, um if you're str i mean what, what what i mean what what will you do i mean what's backup plan is it's to focus on the domestic market presumably because if the australian market and say the chinese market the two big um, inbound um, uh, regional markets don't come back. You know, what's plan B? Yeah, well, Bali is really fortunate to be well-known destinations uh, across all markets, you know. Mm. Um, and Australians, were, well, I'm in Australia at the moment. Um, Australians are missing Bali really hard. So they will return as, it is as soon as it's permitted. And I know that the first flights back to Bali will be really glorious. Um, until then, I think we will be catering a lot more to, and when the time comes, to the regional short to medium haul markets. Uh, right. So, for example, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Japan, China, um, and South Korea. Uh, for Sudamala, the most likely way that we will do this um, is by doing test runs with properties uh, that already have profile with domestic and regional market. Um, and those ones uh, will be Lombok and Labuan Bajo for us instead of Bali. Thanks. Um, Lucien, um, so when the market really does start to return, what can guests expect at Tugu? I mean, what have you been doing during this, 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 this very quiet period? You know, what's, what, what's going to be the new uh, protocol and the new um, uh, in, your, in your resorts and how are they going to look? Um, you know, of course, the first thing we have done uh, when this all started is to uh, implement all the strictest um, hygiene and safety procedures just like required by WHO and you know the disinfecting again and again the mask the gloves the social distancing but uh, you know to be honest I don't really believe we need to change so much um, I think of course being a developing country like Bali Indonesia uh, people uh, are extra cautious about coming here. Um, they worry about what if they get sick and so on and so forth. So we do need to make sure that all of this is 100% there, 100% safe. Uh, um, however, I don't believe that the clients would want to be reminded every second, everywhere they look that, you know, they are in this scary new world, you know. I think when they come to holiday, they still want to feel safe and forget about all that. Um, so uh, not going super overboard that you lose your own authentic positioning and becoming another super sterilized hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think fortunately at Tugu, uh, because of our small infantry and our, our uh, setup that is pretty spread out, uh, there's not so much that we have to change in terms of that. We never had breakfast buffet. Uh, our dining concept has always been wherever you wish. We can set table in that corner of the garden, that corner of the beach. Um, our our 100 meters beach only have 30, 40 pairs of lounge chairs. There's a lot of private plunge pools. Um, so it allows for people to be social distancing if they like mm -hmm. without being too overbearing. So yeah, that sounds, that sounds great, Emily. During the lockdown, have you been? Um, uh, the resorts have been, uh, been been cleaned up, and they're going to be spick and span and, and ready to to open at an appropriate time. What's the environment oh. um, around? You know, what's the environment like also um, around the areas in which in which, in which you're located? Yeah, well, absolutely. One of the blessings in disguise is that we've been able to do detailed maintenance like never before. Um, our resorts have never looked more beautiful, actually. Um, the surrounding nature has also had time to replenish itself. So, for example, our coral reef um, at Sudamala Sraya in La Bombajo uh, is even healthier than before. Um, the gorgeous variety of birds that visit our premises have also increased. And the sky, of course, is bluer than ever. Um, How are the dragons the getting on? Are... Sorry? How are the dragons getting on? Oh, the dragons, I'm pretty sure they're pretty happy. No one's poking at them. <laughs> um, uh, but, but they're probably getting fed a little less. Um, so I probably would have to go back to, you know, their, 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 their wild instincts. Um, but yeah, so our office continues to run, though minimally. So technically, this means we can reopen whenever post-pandemic world is ready. Um, I agree with, um, with Lucien that, you know, when, when, when the time for travel comes back, you know, you don't want to be reminded of this scary new world all the time. 
Um, right. And in saying that, Sudamala is also preparing um, new safety and health protocols that will be fit into our, what our guests have come to expect, expect when they stay with us. Um, and our main advantage is that Sudamala's designs have always put a strong emphasis on space. Um, our resorts are all spacious and airy, so we already have existing infrastructure to support new protocols. So hopefully not in very, very much will change in terms okay, of how we deliver our services. No, that, 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 that sounds fantastic. All backed up by, um, we love Bali. People love Bali, right, yes, but um, we're, 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 um, um, ladies, thank you so much. Um, um, for, for, your, for your insights. Emily Subrata and Lucien uh, Anna, thanks so much. And um, please stick around. There'll be some questions for you coming up. Right, we're going to move on. Um, Mimi Hudoyo, the editor, Indonesia of TTG Asia. You have a guest for us today, do, do you not, Mimi? Mimi, I you need to unmute, Mimi, please. Yeah. On mute. There we go. Thank you, there Mimi. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So my guest is um, uh, Ibu Francisca, and I'm going to uh, discuss a bit with her. Hello, uh, Ibu Siska. How Hello, are you? Hello, Ibu Mimi. Very good in Bali here. <laughs> yeah. So how are you? How is Bali today? What is the condition in Bali right now? It's um, it's quite empty at this moment, but the sky are blue and then the weather is very nice. So, <laughs> okay, but how how bad has actually um the uh, the COVID nineteen has hit the industry in Bali? Okay, so um, I think it was shown before by the STR presentation. If you ask everybody, like um. Lucien and also Emily, everybody said the same answer that this is the worst one that we mm -hmm. face so far after mm -hmm. the Bali bombing, after the Mount Agung, this is the worst one that we face so yeah. far. But, yeah. uh, but you do get um, uh, support from the government, don't you? Yep, yep, yep. After a long lobbying with the government, of course, we all have uh, helps with the government like the tax incentive and relaxation. But again, we have to remember that it is a very specific uh, law and regulation with specific requirements. So meaning that not everybody will benefit from it. So mm. it depends on your properties. It depends on the company. You know, not a lot of um, companies will benefit of it. I guess that's the answer book. Okay, but, but um, what are the uh, stakeholders now doing to prepare for the new normal, the next normal, whatever you call it? <clears throat> well, um, same answer, I guess. So everybody's preparing for the new SOPs, you know, for the um, quote-unquote uh, CHS protocols, you know, what the government has been promoting, like cleanliness, health and safety protocols for three remaining areas, employees, guests or customers, and also our suppliers. Okay, that's going to start from the airport arrivals, you know, accommodation, tour and travel. So everything, every aspects, you know, from arrival until departure for our guests. Uh, guidelines, it's all provided by the Minister of Health and of course the Minister of Tourism. As you know, we all received the latest uh, law and regulations from the Minister of Health. It was dated on the 19th of June. It was 66 pages and it all includes what you have to do in hotels and what to comply. Yeah, I see. Okay, that's good news. That was just announced, I think, uh, a few days ago, yeah? Yes, that's it yep. Most recent, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, and but in the meantime, uh, uh, what have you, all the uh, travel industry, um, doing to keep Bali on top of travelers' minds? Okay, so this is very interesting. Like, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, Bali Hotel Associations. And what we are doing is actually doing a social media campaign. And we call it 60 Days of uh, Virtual Bali Will Welcome You Back. So for Bali Will Warmly Welcome You Back and Soon. So uh, basically, we are collecting all the posts, the stories from our members, and then we post it. 
and sort of like to keep um, the travelers so about the people about the culture about the food about the music about the dance and about the resorts itself and then that's the first phase i mean for the past two months that's what we've been doing and we reposted about 240 uh, posts and stories about our members and now we are going to be on the second phase where we are going to promote the new normal where we are going to promote that our members are actually doing the requirements for the new normal the sops you know our duty of care and etc and that is an under preparation is it yep yeah but when are you going to launch that uh in the um first of july that's our second phase yeah of the new normal social media campaign. Okay, so um, we, we also heard that, um, you know, uh, the international travelers are so eager to come back and uh, visit Bali. And uh, tour operators also have been asking, when will Bali and Indonesia reopen? And of course, uh, this is for the government to decide, yeah, but uh, in your view, uh, when will Bali actually be um, ready to welcome travelers again? Um, if you ask the hotels, I guess the answer will be we are ready. Okay, mm. so um, our members, we are ready to open our doors, you know, training is ongoing, new SOP is ongoing, we are ready to welcome travelers, but it's not from us now, the decision is on the government side, and it's, um, it's depending on a lot other factors to not only accommodation, so one thing to keep in mind is also the country policy of travelers who enter that country book. So yeah. as you may know, there are a lot of um, news about, you know, people, the new rules going to be, people have to be quarantined 14 days, certain deposit to be paid. You know, is there any, is there any uh, uh, flight routes coming to Bali? Is there, is there going to be the, uh, visa on arrival implemented back so it's still like we are still uh, sort of like holding to this um when 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 book so <laughs> at this moment it's still like we still have to base on the rules and regulation by the minister of uh, foreign affairs which is dated on the 1st of april which is there's a still a restriction for foreign visitor which is under uh, unfortunately uh, further notice. Okay, but the industry itself, uh, um, uh, members of the industry are ready actually, yeah? Yeah, for I'm Member talking on behalf of hotel side. Hotel yeah, all right, okay. Um, a few days ago, the government has announced that uh, they are planning to create travel bubbles, right? With China, South Korea, uh, Japan, and uh, Australia. Uh, what is your view on that? I mean, wouldn't it be more logical to start, you know, um, having bubbles or creating bubbles with neighboring countries? What do you think? Okay, so um, I think at this stage, I believe that it is still on discussion um, between G2G and mm -hmm. it will start with the business travelers first, as mentioned by the official. Um, if we can comply with all the specific requirements like the infection rate has to be below one or even zero infrastructure such as like the hospitals health uh, procedures and everything like the protocols then you know you, we can do travel bubbles but it's still a long way to go i think again like we need the the official to address uh what is the reality of the situations yeah are we ready? Are Bali and Indonesia ready for the travel bubbles? I mean, for, for the whole world, Indonesia, it's still a red zone or high risk country. So okay. um, I think it's still quite on discussion level. Okay. And what about the, uh, with the regional um, destinations like, uh, you know, uh, ASEAN countries, for example, would it, mm. it, it would be easier, right? Uh, um, probably yes, because it's the more logical choices, like it has similar characteristic with Indonesia and it is a shorter uh, time of traveling, like a short haul. 
But again, um, it's a bit early to comment further, Bu, because we are still, you know, have to observe, have to see everything and how things are progressing and evolving, Bu. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, talking about future, um, what major changes do you think um, that uh, the travel needs to, uh, you know, uh, in the future? What are the, the, the uh, I'm sorry, uh, major changes in travel trends that you expect to see uh, after the COVID-19 uh, period? Okay. And so. also, um, how will Bali be, you know, uh, fit? Uh, in that uh, new paradigm? So I guess first of all, the travels uh, will expect a certain level of uh, hygiene and safety. But again, as mentioned before, they will not want to go to a holiday destination um, like a hospital destination. It's quite scary to go like, to, I'm on hospital destination. So still we have to maintain the feeling of the holiday destination. Um, and it's going to be a um, time of adjusting, like uh, trials, how far our potential customer wants the standard to be like. So that's the first one. And then I think the second one, it's the pattern of, you know, going to go on easy booking, you know, flexible cancellations. That's the first what the customers are looking for. And then, of course, travel insurance going to be a big part of traveling now. And, you know, people start thinking, you know, driving versus uh, flying, you know, which one is more lower risk for. So there are a lot of changes, you know, as far as Bali itself. Uh, I heard a lot of people now, you know, feeling a bit uh, claustrophobic with the air con, you know, with the high rise building. They would like to stay in the open air outdoor, like mentioned with the ladies here, like Bali hotels have a lot to offer with the open air, open space, you know, uh, yeah. the, uh, of course, with the social distancing in place and everything like that. Work from home, everybody is now doing like work from hotel. Um, mm. I guess Bali have a perfect place to work for, you know, uh, with, this, okay. with this high speed. Okay. Sorry, David. Uh, yeah. uh, no, no, uh, um, uh, not not at all. Um, I think we we um, we we please stick around because there's going to be some questions after. There's been quite a few questions for you actually that that have, that have come through. Um, we're going to have to we're going to have to move on in the interest of time. Um, thank you very much, uh, Francisca Hand Handagol from, uh, from Bali Hotels Association, and Mimi, of course. Thanks so much for your help. Um, we're going to move on to uh, at, the, uh, at the moment to Bali to a presentation by Matt Gebby. Matt Gebby is the director, Asia Pacific, uh, Pacific Asia, Indonesia, Paul HTL. Um, and he's going to talk about Bali Hotel operations by the numbers. Matt, over to you, please. Uh, thanks, David. Um, firstly, I would like to say a big thanks to Sumi, David and Bill for putting this together and putting together all the webinars that you have done over the last month or so, trying to keep us industry folk all together. Uh, it's much appreciated and, and thank you very much. So my talk today is a look at when it's time to reopen. Uh, there might be a recovery, but is it adequate? So when are we going to stop the flow in essence? Preparation and planning, of course, is key. Uh, where are the financial and non-financial sweet spots uh, for reopening? How do we gauge that? Reopening too soon, of course, causes more bleeding. Uh, has the market recovered adequately to enable short-term survival of the hotels? Uh, opening up costs money, but a prolonged closure could also cost more money, uh, particularly if your competitors reopen and capture some of your market share or steal the staff. In general, um, the guidelines that we've put together to look at uh, include getting your staff together, right? To talk about as many people as they can in the industry. Get regular updates from people like uh, Francisca in the BHA, the PHRI, the airport authorities, who are saying what about the industry. Get as many reliable numbers as you can. Talk to the government, of course, because if you're plugging in numbers that are garbage, of course, garbage will come out of your modeling and will potentially uh, cause you to reopen or consider reopening too early. 
Run some sensitivity analysis. Look at where your occupancy will, happens when your occupancy is 10%. What happens when it's 30%? What methods can we look at to forecast our performance to be closer to perhaps gauging the future? And what are some of the strategic considerations, including m and &E maintenance, staffing levels, reskilling, et cetera? So one of these methods that you can have a look at uh, prior to reopening, prior to having that conversation with your staff is a break-even analysis. It's basically an assessment of the hotel's performance. Uh, as you can see from this basic economics model, uh, units sold across the bottom is room nights sold. Uh, fixed costs are the carrying costs of your hotel. Variable costs start to increase once your hotel reopens. Fixed costs include lease payments, insurance, property taxes, some component of salaries for your core staff, and the variable costs are things like the cost of goods sold when you reopen your restaurant and also for labor costs and utilities, perhaps. We wanted to give you a snapshot of what it looked like in the good times, 2019, 2018. What were some of these numbers? What were some of the break-even points uh, for the hotels across Bali? Now we look here in US dollars, of course we don't use that um, normally, but I'm using that for a regional perspective for those of you who are not based in Indonesia. And what we've done is we've looked back at our annual survey, hotel industry survey of operations that we undertake every year. This year, uh, from the numbers, we had about 60 or 70 hotels in Bali uh, and about 300 across the country. So RevPAR, of course, is the key performance indicator. Uh, it's a product of daily rate and occupancy. And as we look back, uh, Indonesia's break-even rev part was around 35 US dollars. With the numbers that we aggregate uh, across the country, across Bali, we have sufficient numbers to break it up into segments. Uh, we do that using a rate segmentation, uh, and you'll see that on the slide. The first one being under $35, and the second one being greater than $250. Now, I would just like to add the disclaimer that these are normal operating conditions, and this is a benchmark that you can use when you're analyzing the non-normal conditions that we're in right now. Note, I said non-normal, not new normal. Um, and the slide now shows what happens, how we generate, basically, that RevPAR. As I mentioned, RevPAR is a function of rate and occupancy. So the occupancy relationship is fairly linear. The lower tier hotels under 35 bucks uh, historically have needed around 64% occupancy to break even at a rate of around $25. If we go up the scale to USD 85 to 145, the occupancy decreases, of course, total revenue is increasing and fixed costs are becoming a smaller proportion of that. And occupancy can, of course, reduce uh, to still maintain that break-even occupancy at a rate of around $110. The higher end hotels, the luxury end of the scale, greater than $250 US, the occupancy decreases again to a break-even of around 30% and a rate of about $426. So how do we get to those numbers? Basically, there's a few steps that we looked at uh, in order to generate those numbers. And these steps should be undertaken prior to reopening to get a better assessment of where you are and whether it's the right time or not. Now, bear in mind that these are just the financial considerations. There are, of course, non-financial considerations. So what are your carrying costs? You're not starting from scratch. They may include partial opening. You may still have staff on site. Uh, you may have a lean no, skeleton staff, whether it's security or whether it's some housekeeping, etc. Utilities, I know if you're running a block hotel, you can perhaps turn off some of the M&E. Uh, however, in some cases you can't. The hygiene and compliance costs, of course, as keeps getting mentioned, are new costs or increased costs to what they were before. Now, when you've done that, we need to start looking at the business model. As Jasper mentioned, the new guests uh, in the future, and as Lucien and Emily mentioned, and Boo Francisca, the guest model over the next 
six months, 12 months is going to change. Are we able to charge the same rates that we were? Are we able to target the same market segments? What are those market segments? Perhaps previously it was mice. Now perhaps it's going more towards the government or the BOMN. As the stimulus packages in the government start to kick in, they start to travel more. So how is that going to affect your business model? And what does that look like from a break-even threshold? Do you need more volume now that your rates have decreased? And how much is that rate decrease and what is that volume change? Of course, you need to have a look at the uh, reopening costs. What has happened? How many staff have you laid off? What does it cost to reopen the, the building? There's some retraining involved, of course. Um, add those in to make sure that you're still financially better off by reopening. Get your staff together and run through your cash flows. So what does the whole thing look like? Um, what have they learned about your source markets? Have there been any outbreaks? Is there likely to be a shutdown in the borders again? What are the government rules and regulations? Airport authorities, what's the BHA telling you to do about your hotel? Now, once that's all worked out, you can do your cash flow, which I'll look at in a moment, uh, and then you can start to put aside, or have your owner start to put aside sufficient working capital. Now, we ran a model on the next slide, which looks at what some of those costs may have been uh, for a hotel in the 85 to $145 bracket. It has about 274 keys. Currently, running costs are at about $187,000 a month, negative. Once we start to reopen, of course, there's some reopening costs at around 40K. Uh, and once the occupancy builds up over the four months to the end of the year, I've used September because right now the uh, government is talking about July, late July, August for domestic and perhaps international for September. I'm still extremely optimistic about the international will come back. Um, so in any case, we can enable these months one, two, three, four. They don't need to have months assigned to them. So as the months pass, your occupancy, of course, improves. There might be a bump in rate. And of course, the loss reduces month by month. And in our model, by month four, you've reached break even. Now, the key point to this is that over that four months, the net loss, of course, is a lot less than the net loss of staying closed. Now, that's purely from a financial perspective, but you also need to consider your staff. As I mentioned earlier, if you stay closed and your competitors reopen, there is a chance that staff will lead in loyalty. Local supply chains. What's happened to the local supply chains? The hotels are the physical manifestation of tourism, but there's an entire network of people that are supporting the hotels, the market gardens, the laundry, et cetera, et cetera. Maintaining those relationships, make sure that those organizations survive is also extremely important for the hotel industry when rebound happens. In, sh in short, make sure that your ducks are all aligned. Uh, don't jump the gun. Make sure that the numbers add up. Make sure you've talked to as many people as possible before those decisions are made and that your staff are on board. From that previous slide, data will talk. Uh, at Hallworth, we're data freaks. So, of course, we're likely to say that. But in this case, numbers are what's most important in order to get that decision correct. Now, I thought over the last couple of days, rather than just talking doom and gloom, I thought maybe I'd get out there and ask Skyscanner what their numbers look like for Bali. Skyscanner, for those of you who don't know, ultimately is a, a meta search for flights. So who is looking for flights? How many people are looking for flights to Bali specifically? So this slide, search demand to Denpasar in the last 50 days. In recent days, we're edging up towards about 26 to 28,000 searches per day for Bali. While this has remained relatively constant over the last 50 days, you won't see much fluctuation. Most of those fluctuations are happening on a Sunday, which is the most common day for people to do searches on holidays. 
Uh, now we're increasing to about two to 3,000 searches a day since the beginning of March. Whilst this isn't a huge uptick, uh, it still shows that there is still a lot of people out there looking for Bali as a flight destination. Now this flight, this color slide up here, whoop, one back please. One slide back, there we are. This is by month. So as you can see, uh, the, along the bottom is the search that's happened during the week uh, and the colors are by month. You will have access to all of these uh, numbers in due course, so you can have a look more closely. Uh, there's a nice spread over the next few months. Uh, looking towards December, of course, there is quite a large increase. Now, where are they coming from? On the next slide. The search is by country, um, and what we're seeing in the last uh, 50 days, uh, actually no longer than that, two and a half months, is that there's been a search, an increase in overall searches from the UK, so that could be one of our new source markets. Uh, unfortunately, not so much from Australia and Korea. Uh, they're seeing increases in demand from domestic travel rather than international travel at the moment, uh, but there are still of course, people searching from Korea and Australia. On to the last slide, which shows basically redirects. Now, Skyscanner says that a redirect is actually a pretty good indication of a real booking because it means that they've left Skyscanner to complete their booking at either the OTA or airline. Uh, and as you can see, there is an increase since the beginning of May the trend line is up. What they are noticing at Skyscanner is that there's huge spikes in demand upon government restrictions being lifts, uh, lifted. Uh, and around the occasions that has happened in India, Australia, New Zealand, has had a profound effect on flight searches. And so as soon as those messages start coming from Indonesia and from Bali, whenever that is, we can expect similar trends to occur in the coming weeks and months. And that's it from me. Thanks, David. Matt, Matt, Gabby, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating data and, and insights and helpful advice for everyone. Um, next up, we're going to move swiftly along. Norbert Vass, Vice President, Business Development, Archipelago International. Norbert, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Well, for us, uh, I make it fast because we, we are running out of time here. Uh, Bali is a true case of, I would call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the good in Bali really is that Bali has been very successful in containing the spread of Corona. The traditional banjo system has really led to many villages and community being segregated and self-sufficient. And the virus hasn't spread in Bali anywhere as aggressively and fast as in other parts of the country, which is good. Last time I checked, and my numbers might not be 100% up to date, we had about 1,100 affected people and only nine fatalities, which is pretty much the best in, in the whole region. That is all very, very good. What we also found was quite good in Bali is that many of our employees, uh, they seem to be coping better with this crisis than in other parts of the country. They seem to have more of the social, family, community uh, uh, safety net uh, uh, than our employees in Jakarta who very often have to rent an expensive cost and have their, their home far away from Jakarta. So that is all positive. The bad is that from all of the regions that we operate, and we operate 156 hotels in the country, uh, trading volume in Bali is by far the lowest. Uh, we had uh, statistics into Bali show that in the month of April, we had a total of 327, I repeat that number, 327 foreign visitors. Normally we have a few hundred thousand, so you go figure. And the domestic market, of course, is also not coming. Bali occupancy, the majority of hotels in Bali running far below 10% occupancy. Many even running below 5% occupancy. Many hotels had to close. Out of the 17 hotels that we operate, we had to close six. Uh, that is the bad. Uh, Bali is, when it comes to trading volume, affected more than other parts of the country. Now, the ugly comes now. The ugly is that 
uh, I would love to be positive and I'm glad to see there are some more searches online in regards to flight tickets, what the match just showed us. But we honestly, we don't see it. Yeah? We monitor our pickup on a regular basis and we see huge improvements in destinations that are, for example, driving distance from Jakarta. I give you an example, Aston Anya, last weekend, very first time since the tsunami more than a year ago, on 100% occupancy last weekend. Uh, our hotels in Bogas doing, in Boga also doing quite well now. We are 25 to 35% breaking even already. Bali, we are still putzing around with anywhere between three and 10% with two exceptions only. One hotel where we have an airline crew and the other one where we have government business. The rest is really struggling. And we do not see it getting better anytime soon. We do not see any international travel coming to Bali this year. We also think there is, we feel there's a lot of confusion in the domestic markets. What kind of regulations, what kind of papers do you need? You need a different kind of a test when you fly in than if you drive into the harbor. Communication is not very good. Most people have an adopted a kind of an attitude. Look, I, I will not fly in July. I will not fly in August until this is all clear and I actually know what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. So our hotels are not picking up business anytime soon. We tried promotions. We were very aggressive. We organized a few flash sales with our OTAs. Doesn't matter, I could sell my room right now for 10,000 rupiah, I would still not get a booking. There is no demand. Doesn't matter what kind of a promotion you're running. So that's the ugly. How can we get out of this? We do not know at the moment. We do not know when it will become better. And we see very, very little improvement in terms of pickup over the last two weeks. We saw a little bit, but not enough to really talk about it and say it's getting better. So that's the ugly. What can hotels do? Uh, Matt, your presentation was very, very good. I uh, enjoyed it. For us, uh, our response was basically built on five pillars. The most important one right away, urgent, and also the ugliest was cash flow protection. So going into our hotels, having the GMs redo every week a cash flow analysis, looking at PTP, reducing payroll by 50, 60, 70%, evenly spreading it out in the, amongst the employees, uh, going to suppliers, renegotiating contracts, going to all of our hotel owners and telling them they don't have to pay fees until later in the year, things like this. We did whatever is possible to maintain our cash flow. Still, we have a few hotels that might run out of cash by July. We have others who can hang in a little bit longer. So cash flow protection was the number one. The number two, of course, is safety, hygiene standards. So we worked with the uh, uh, World Tourism Council, uh, Travel and Council, whatever it's called. We have a standardization in place that's very good. Uh, we tested, we have regular testing every two weeks, all of our employees, we bought more than 20,000 test, test kits to do that. So safety was extremely important too. And now comes the next, what do you do next? Continue monitoring our cash flow. Right now my job is really to curb enthusiasm. Some of our GMs starting becoming a little bit too enthusiastic. <laughs> we need to keep them conservative. Communications with our owners has been extremely important. Uh, we found out that many hotel companies seem to have a trouble there, but we, we kept on proactively reaching out to our owners, telling them what we do, what needs to be done, which hotel should be closed, which hotel can stay open. Uh, it depends on what kind of an air conditioning system you have. What is your cost structure? You know, a two-star safe hotel with 100 rooms and split air cons can remain open even if you only have five or six guests. A big resort on a central chilling unit with a 300 million, 350 million rupiah electricity bill, no matter what might have to close. So there's, there's a lot that needed to be done there. So communication with the owners is extremely important. And the next step for us was, which was actually the fun part is, how do you keep busy? What can you actually do to keep, to make a little bit of a positive out of that, yeah, of this whole crisis? And it was kind of fun. There, there's a lot of projects. I'm sure you all had similar experiences, things that you always wanted to do. You knew you always had to do, but you never really had the time to do it. Finally, you were able to do it. So we did a lot of things in, in terms of like revisiting brand standards, redoing training manuals, basically everything we ever created, rate grids, rate loading, uh, yield management, everything we ever wanted, everything we ever produced, we retreat, improved about it, and we used this three, four months of doing all those kind of intellectual work to get rid of things, to do projects that we were unable to do in the, in the past. And many of our hotels did the same thing. Uh, there was a comment today, uh, I think, Emily, you said your hotels are more beautiful than ever before. 
congratulations. So ours, we did a lot of deep cleaning. We finally we had the time to actually go into the balance tank and the rooftop tank and scrap everything clean and repaint everything and service all the AC units. So there's a lot of positive coming out of that as well. The last step, sorry if I'm talking too much, the last step which for us is extremely important now is how do we guide our hotels towards a sensible reopening you know, cash flow, yes, projections, Matt, as you said, very, very important. But for us, it was more important about what message are we sending out to the community. We do not want that our hotels enter what we call the clean wars. I do not know if you have noticed it, but in our humble opinion, a lot of hotels coming out with crazy ads and really strange initiatives. I've seen another ad before of a, of a hotel with a, with a front office employee, like with mask and face and gloves. It looks like you're not checking into a hotel, you're, you're checking into a, a nuclear power station. You know, it's, it's really not that kind of advertising and messaging and marketing that we need to generate demand and interest in travel again. So we are teaching and working with our hotels, our GMs, our DSMs in, 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 in getting the message across that you know, they should, people should be traveling again, that's their God-given right to travel, that the positive about travel, being cautious and fair, but without scaring people away. And we're definitely not entering into the clean war. Who produces the coolest video showing you know, how clean the hotel is? I think this is the wrong way to go. So we are not engaging in this. Uh, and that's what would be my advice to all of my colleagues in Bali is that um, we should start thinking about how we position our island again and not enter the clean wars. Uh, last but not least, the only uh, statement I have to say is we in our company, we advise our owners in Bali as well as our GMs to remain vigilant and conservative. Our outlook for this year remains to be very pessimistic. We do not see much improvement until late first quarter next year. And all of our financial forecasting and all of our preparation is geared towards protecting our owner's cash flow. Until that time, we will be very conservative and very careful with anything we do. And that's it. Thank you. Norbert, Norbert Vass, thank you. Straight between the eyes. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Excellent. Um, Bill Barnett, we're going to move over to you. Um, and you're, you're going to talk about um, uh, Bali, China, and sentiment. Bill, please. Uh, hi there. And actually, actually, God, I don't know Norbert. Uh, yes, I think they woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning, which this is, I'm, I'm depressed. Anyway, I love Matt's presentation because there are green shoots. And I think that's important, you know, when we talk about how things are going to be, you know, going forward. We, what I understand, after 9-11, which was one of the most horrific instances in the past few decades, people took their shoes off at airports for years and years and years. The world took their shoes off, but they continued to travel. People continued to get on airplanes. They took baby steps. They traveled near to home, but they got on airplanes again. And those shoes today, again, people in the future are going to be traveling with masks. And that's what's going to be different. But people do travel. And I think that, you know, that's the one underlying thing. You know, the sun's going to rise tomorrow. The sun's going to set tomorrow. And we are moving through this, but people will travel. The question is when. And I think something, just before I talk about China, I think we want to talk about room rates. And what we've seen in Thailand, you know, I got on an airplane two days ago for the first time in three months. So it, much to the comfort of my wife and myself, you know, we're both glad to get away from each other. But it was interesting because, again, it's nice to go and I, I want to travel. You talk about revenge travel and everything else. I'm sitting here in a hotel in Bangkok today. It's a pleasure to get back into a hotel and support this industry. But what we're seeing with room rates, and we've seen this in the past, is that people will throw down on rates. I think Jesper said it very clearly in, you know, in terms of that, you know, rates are not, rates are gonna fall out the window, absolutely for the rest of this year. It, every hotel owner out there is gonna just want to cover their payrolls. They're gonna throw down rates. And what we're seeing here in Thailand that could also happen in Indonesia is we're seeing even the large hotel groups going out and trying to prepay, trying to sell certificates, trying to pre-sell, you know, tremendous offerings at low discounted offerings. So we're going back into a cycle again, you know, for the hotel groups, you know, clearly big international chains are not prepared for situations like this because they're going to deal sites like Megatex. You'll see certainly luxury escapes will be out there selling massive amount of room nights. So we're starting a cycle again, which is going to start that up. I think that's going to be interesting because it's going to drag rates down. But at least there is going to be some kind of bookings out there. There's going to be some kind of cash flow for this year. And that's going to be the case going forward. So everything about this year is getting some cash in the bank, paying your salaries, but it's all on demand. It's not about room rates at all. So that's not going to change. Where are the green shoots? And I still believe, you know, we, you know, we work together with Delivering Asia to do some, uh, 
surveys of consumers on the mainland because sentiment, because what is the sentiment? We talk a lot about revenge travel and everything, people wanting to travel. And that's, you know, from Matt's notes with Skyscanner, you saw you're seeing the interest out there, meaning people are showing where they're going to be coming. And what's important is the early travelers late this year, early next year are gonna be different travelers, right? These are gonna be the people who are, who are gonna be the first adopters and start traveling. Those are the people where we focused on when we talked in China, was saying, who are these people? And it's interesting, again, we talked to over 1,100 people in first tier cities you, you, you know, across China to understand who and what was the travel sentiment towards Bali. And I think, you know, traditionally we all know going backwards, you know, in terms of uh, China, how predominant or it has been government as an international player, certainly challenging Australia over the past few years as well. It's our belief that China will come back sooner than Australia, simply because the Australian travel bubble and the situation they're saying is probably the first quarter next year. We think China will come back earlier. So there's a lot of numbers there. And, you know, I think what we're trying to help with Sotelli is say, how do you get to those customers? You know, what's their behavior going to be? And again, it's interesting because when you're talking about people, would you like to travel again? You know, you know, when do you want to travel? There is sentiment for late this year. You know, you have national holidays late in the year in China. You've got Chinese New Year, I think next year is in February as well. So certainly fourth quarter of this year and first quarter of next year, we see a lot of sentiment out there. But as I said, over 50, almost 50% 50 of the people wanted to travel either late this year or early next year. So that's a positive. It's not just all a domestic story. You know, and I think it's interesting when you look about safety is because 35% of the people thought that Bali would be a safer destination than others during this. And certainly 86% would like to travel there. And that's good, again. And 24%, this is actually higher than other countries we did. So there's a lot more repeat China business than we've had in other destinations. We've looked at Philippines, we've looked at Thailand, we've looked at Vietnam, but 24% was larger. So, you know, why do people want to go there? And, you know, why do they choose the destination? Again, affordability you know, plays a big part. That's almost 50% where they're saying it's affordable destination for mainland Chinese. Word of mouth certainly is there. Travel distance, again, it's not a long way to go. And I think door-to-door -door travel, you know, you're gonna see these corridors opening up which are inter-regional traffic. So I think that's important. And why are people wanting to travel? And we've done this across a lot of other countries. We're seeing a lot more people now interested in nature. You know, we start seeing more people involved in, in looking at sightseeing elements as well, certainly beach resorts, but it's not in cities. You know, it, it's a lot of resort demand out there. You know, in cities like Bangkok, where I am today, you're getting staycations, but as soon as the Thais want to get up country, they want to get in the car and they want to go out somewhere as well. So I think that really gives us some buffer as well that domestic tourism also will go to places like Bali because they consider that to be a safe destination. And who would you rather travel with? You know, in terms of that, certainly, you know, again, family oriented. Also, you know, we do see more friends traveling together as well and couples, certainly. So that's where the traffic is. But certainly for families, families, again, from mainland Chinese, they like to come together to Bali. So that has continued demand there. In terms of accommodation, four-star hotels, again, which is interesting, again, because that's, you know, we're seeing people, maybe they're not in the past, they may be in the five-star category, but now people are taking a look and the first travelers want to have some affordability. In terms of how long they, you know, they'd like to stay, again, three days, is quite long actually, you know, for, for here in Thailand, the average length of stay for China markets, 2.5 days. So again, that was encouraging to see that number. And I think certainly in terms of what booking methodology people use, and what we're seeing here is the ability to uh, uh, influence these China travelers through social media. Certainly you have a, a C trip, which is a major provider, but when we look at Fliggy, we look at WeChat and everything else, you can impact and you, if you can get to the Chinese travelers and create a strong messaging, it's, it's interesting, but uh, about two years ago, when we, when we had a boat sinking incident in Thailand, we went back and looked at what mainland Chinese were talking about Thailand. And we always saw very positive uh, uh, feedback about Bali, certainly positive feedback about Vietnam as well. But looking at those categories, because you're not seeing it in English, you've got to go back and look at Chinese social media to understand that market. But I think something we all talk about is a future outlook, you, you know, towards that. Now, we, you know, China's going to continue to be a key player. And something we say is airlift. Airlift is everything. You can't stay there if you can't get there. And the low-cost airlines or the regional airlines can react much quicker than legacy carriers. That's why we think China market will come back certainly in the, in the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of next year. I love to have the practical things. I still believe things will get worse till they get better, but they will get better. You know, again, we're going to take our shoes off at the airport. We're going to put our masks on and we're going to, we are going to travel. So, you know, I think the future is bright for Bali as well, but it's going to take time. David, over to you. Thank you, Bill. Some positivity at last. That's just so good to hear.
a, a potential um, uh, the Chinese market potentially coming back in, in the fourth quarter. People love barley. The Chinese love barley. Vanessa Zhu, um, uh, China director delivering age communications based in Shanghai. Um, uh, could you just um, go through a couple, of, um, a couple of points for us, please, regarding this new Chinese traveler that's emerging? I understand that it, it, you know, the Chinese travel is more independent, so there's no, no big tour bookings, um, more digital. How do we reach them? Vanessa Chu, please. Hi, everyone. Yes, definitely. Um, I'm Vanessa, so I would like to share some insights with you guys. So uh, basically, for right now, we definitely are looking for like a FIT, fully independent travelers, and their age are much younger, and they are more experienced travelers, and they are also more engaged into the mobile phone internet. So during the COVID, uh, there's a new pattern has been developed. Um, so people not using WeChat to receive information. We also use a uh, TikTok in China. China, we call them Douyin. So we also use Douyin. It's uh, like an app filled by a lot of uh, video contents. Um, so it's all sort of thing that, uh, so we use TikTok to receiving all the informations. And uh, so TikTok was owned by Alibaba. You guys probably heard about it. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Compare with C trip, um, those young FIT travelers, they are hooked on Fliggy as well. Fliggy actually is um, the tourism product section for Taobao. It's um, Taobao actually is the largest uh, e-commerce platform in China. It's the it's the e-commerce, um, the the only one, the only biggest one on the in, in China. So the with Fliggy, so the young FIT travelers tend to uh, jump on Fliggy to to look at the products. So compare with uh, Fliggy and a sea trip is a uh, different. So Fliggy actually is more like a department store. So allows hotel to form in their own products and bring it into customer. And then we use Alipay, which is um, the one of the major. Um, electronic payment method in, in, in China, among Chinese. So you form your own product and then you present on Fliggy and then people like it, you can, the, the sales can be resolved directly via, via Alipay, Alipay. So compare with Ctrip, it's more like OTA um, platform, the tourism products. So Fliggy will be um, more direct and uh, allows a hotel has more freedom to form in their own products. Thank and you, I would Vanessa. Like just to share, yeah, please. Um, I have some new data just coming. So, according to Fliggy, uh, from February until right now, it has been launched about over 28,000 uh, live streaming uh, online shopping, uh, live streaming sessions. And it has been driven like 250 million of uh, the, the, the viewers to viewing all the live streaming online shopping um, sessions. And uh, so, which means it's like a almost like uh, around 200 live streaming per day is launched or related to tourism products. Wow, that's great. It's, re it's really, really encouraging news. Thanks, Vanessa, um, uh, for sharing the information about this new ecosystem. Fascinating, really. Maybe this is an opportunity for hotels and bars yes, to start definitely. to retool um, and, uh, and, and, and get ready to tune into this new ecosystem because this is um, where, where, where the bookings um, certainly in this category, 40 down is, is uh, independent travelers is coming from. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to move to Sean Nino. Sean, Sean, um, uh, founder of, of Mantra Bali. Uh, no session would, Hi, be, would be would be would um, be uh, would be complete with about uh, some comments on sustainability. Over to you, Sean, please. Okay. Oh, so much passion within this conversation. Um, but uh, can you guys see my screen right now? Not yet. Hang on. Share screen. Sharing. Okay, we're in business. Okay. So there's, I really appreciated all of your guys' comments and inputs, and it uh, looks like the market is recovering. Um, I, you know, I think we just have to hang in there a little bit. Even though on a, on a personal note, I have to say that I have been absolutely loving Bali and um, been sneaking to the beach and going on my own beach walks and enjoying everything that is here um, without the traffic, without a lot of tourists. It has actually been quite lovely. 
Um, Matt um, and Norbert, I really enjoyed your presentations, but I, I must say that there is not a lot of focus on environment. And um, we do want to see as we recover and as we go into this next decade of tourism, we want to see more focus on environmental performance indicators. And just as much as cash flow or other financial indicators, the environment can also be quantified and it can be reported on. We can be held accountable for it. Management contracts can be structured in a way that managers share responsibilities and report to owners. All of this can be achieved into the future. And I think that we'll all benefit from this if we look towards sustainability in a collective way and work on this some more, put some time and effort into this and really focus on sustainability into the future. I think quality is everyone's responsibility. I think that we need to make a commitment uh, as an industry to preserve the quality of this jewel of this island. And it's our shared responsibility to work on this. I want to share with you some low hanging fruit. As we all live in Asia and we operate in Asia, the majority of our energy is actually spent on cooling. 70% of our electricity is spent on cooling and it is quite um, the controversy because on one end we're burning a lot of coal out in Java. Uh, now we have a coal power plant in Bali too. And then we transfer that electricity over thousands of kilometers to then power our ACs and cool our buildings from the sun. There's a lot we can do to actually reduce the need for cooling and the results are in the realm of hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on the size of your asset, but quite substantial really. We know this from Singapore, we know this from Jakarta, other urban centers, air conditioners are everywhere and ultimately they are releasing heat into the environment. At the same time, the sun is hitting the tarmac, it is hitting the concrete surfaces and it's charging these surfaces to heat up additionally. Overall, we get what is called an urban heat island effect. So we see that within these urban centers and within these tourism centers that the ambient temperature drastically heats up, sometimes as far as 38 degrees, sometimes even 40 degrees. And we can provide design principles to reduce the need for cooling, right? We can do things like using ventilated roofs where we let the heat escape out of, of the roof surfaces so that our air conditioners aren't responsible for cooling down this surface. We can use uh, grating and ventilation. We can create roof cavities. Um, there's all kinds of simple design principles and passive design strategies that we can apply with our architects as well with our contractors um, or our engineering teams to really, really reduce the amount of heat that is getting captured on our property. You should ask yourself right now, while you are so busy uh, cleaning and scrubbing and making your assets look beautiful, look at the walls. Which walls are getting hit by the direct sunlight? Can you create some kind of an awning? Can you create some kind of a structure and grow plants along that wall so that the sun doesn't directly hit the wall and heat it up? Because if you do this, you'll see that your walls stay cold, that the ambient temperature goes down and that inside these spaces, the, the requirement for air conditioning is greatly reduced. This is Alila up in Ubud. Um, one, I really, really love this property. And you can see that there's an abundance of trees. We have over 5,000 species of trees in Indonesia. It's quite remarkable, really. We don't really see that many of these. We don't see many trees on properties. Rather, Bali is somewhat going in this direction. And if we look at the south of Bali, the density of development is so great now that there really is very little space left for the environment. And this is leading to what we call an urban heat gain. It's an environmental impact that we're having. So into the future, I'd like to ask, what can we do as properties to really improve the environment? Can we actually accommodate for space 
to allow water to trickle back into the ground? Can we accommodate for space that shades and cools? Can we build and design our parking lots in a way that grass grows on them and a car can still roll over this space, but it doesn't heat up anymore. Rather more, we are designing with and for the environment so that we collectively don't destroy the asset and space that we all rely on. So in sustainability, um, we all you know, love to argue about uh, which ways to move forward. One size, one side really believes in the technical way. We think that more apps and more technology and uh, better air conditioners and, and more efficient design is ultimately going to lead the way. We can continue to grow as we are with more technology, everything will solve itself. The other side is as extreme and says, well, we don't really need any economic growth. We can all just do yoga. We can all just hang out. Let's focus on culture. Let's focus on gardening. Let's focus on um, being a little bit more sufficient and lightweight on, uh, on our impact. I, I believe that the truth is somewhere in the middle and that systemic change comes from us arguing and continuing to improve. But most importantly, we need to make a commitment. We have to have clear guidelines and indicators as managers, as owners, as developers that guide us through time. Sustainability principles are quite straightforward. The most straightforward one is efficiency. Efficiency is somewhat a cost saving measure. So if you reduce your operating costs by 20 to 30%, if you re reduce your energy costs, your, the, the requirement for water as well as waste, you will immediately see that resources free up and that you can use those financial resources to then invest into other sustainability ch uh, channels and uh, solutions if you like. So again, coming full circle, I'd like to ask how can we design and develop environmental performance indicators? How can we make these performance indicators part of our management narrative, part of our operating procedures, part of our contracts, right? Term contracts, management contracts, holding managers accountable for their performance, for potentially even uh, giving them uh, financial uh, uh, benefits um, if they are improving the environment, if these performance indicators are improving over time. I think there's a lot that we can add to how we report and how we measure success. It doesn't necessarily need to be financial means. It doesn't just mean occupancy, but there is also the environment, which is our collective asset, which we all rely on and which we need into the future. So to close this, I'd like to say that my generation, the millennials, as well as all the younger generations are all looking for businesses, hotels, operations that care, that have a sustainability narrative and that somewhat understand what it means to measure and to monitor the environment. Thanks guys. Giornino, thank you. Excellent, inspirational stuff and some simple solutions that hotels can, can, can take to, um, uh, to, uh, to have a more um, conscious business. Um, we are um, uh, we are quite tied on time, but I'm going to start with a few questions, um, uh, and we and we've got we've got time for five or six only. Yes, but I'm going to start with you, please. Um, there's been there's been there's been a lot of people wanting you to look into your crystal ball and to look at some assumptions you can make on the barley recovery in terms of hotel performance for this year. Is there anything additional that you can share there? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, be, uh, what, what everyone's saying. It's, of course, the base, I'm less optimistic uh, than Bill. I don't think China will travel in 2020. I hope I'm wrong. I hope you're right, Bill. But given that, and the fact that there's no, you know, drive markets, that kind of like, we talked about Bangkok uh, a couple of weeks ago, where domestic will reboot differently. So in light of that, if I see, and I said, don't compare to 2019, but if we said, when do you have that great level again of 70% occupancy around the world? Nowhere near, like 23, 24. So it is, you know, looking at that data instead, look at the full p data that we have or the report performance, just go like, well, in 2022, I'd like to be halfway to where I should be. 
so I think we are far, far away. Demand could absolutely be back by 2022. It could, best case scenario. But all that new supply and other factors means that performance wise it's going to take much much longer so and people said oh you're too negative now but i'm actually i i'm happy to stand up and defend the model that we've taken into this i call it negative i call it realistic david i'm sorry and pe people will return <laughs> eventually but it's going to take a lot longer this time yes but, th but thank you but people love bali and hopefully the governments um, in china and the governments in indonesia um, share that and they create a nice tunnel coming uh, coming coming straight in um, sure. Uh, let's, let's, let's hope that happens this year. Um, um, just a few, a few other questions, please. There's a bit a lot on cost, actually, um, and I want to put this one out to Lucien and Emily um, regarding what, what do you feel are going to be the additional costs of your reopening? Um, and are you looking at bringing in any high technology, kind of high tech, low touch technology, um, you know, QR codes, coded menus, self check in, all of this kind of thing? Is this going to um, increase the costs of your opening. Lucien? Lucien, hi, you need to unmute, please. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, as I said, because some of our restaurants are already open, so we are already starting to work and starting to implement some of these um, such as QR codes um, for contactless ordering uh, in restaurants. Um, eventually, of course, uh, the check-in, check-out uh, will be contactless as well. But like I said before, uh, we are not the kind of hotel, we're not really business hotels. Uh, we're not the kind of hotels that I think will, will um, uh, put us everywhere. Like I said before, we, we are still trying to not to lose our authentic positioning and we want to strengthen that part. Um, whereas doing still the 100% safety and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I don't see that the cost will go up um, tremendously for our hotels of, of our size. How are you, how how are you finding that? How are you, thank, 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 thanks, Lucien. How are you finding that, Emily? Are you, are you, are you, um, how are you preparing actually to reopen? Are you looking to make new investments um, or, uh, or are you going to open really slowly? What, what's, what's your plan? So I think for us, um, Sudamala is, uh, is quite at a similar positioning uh, with Tugu as well in that, um, you know, our, our service really is about, um, you know, the personalized experience. Um, and so th there really is a delicate balance that I think we need to achieve, um, whereby the new protocols are, um, are implemented, uh, but we don't lose our DNA um and and you know that that whole experience of the whole um you know very warm service where it's very personalized um so uh yeah i think we will have to implement some technologies to help us um do uh you know perform perform our service in in a safer way um so for example you know lucian has already mentioned qr codes um contactless payments um i don't really i'm not really sure about maybe check-ins you still need to do um you know a, a personal face-to-face -face, um i mean of course it's, it's going to be up to the guests but uh you know check out is probably it's easier to to um to to do contactless um and we're thinking of ways in for example delivering amenities you know if someone wants more shampoos or more body lotions how do we you know it's it hotels are about a million detailed things right so um you know how, how do you deliver that with, with with limiting contact do we have do we do we give them baskets or you know so it's like I said, this it's going to be a, a delicate balance that we'll have to find. Um, and on that note, yeah, costs will definitely have increase. Yeah, it's going to be, a, it, it's, it's, it's obviously a challenge and you've only got the domestic market re really to work with. Um, Matt, Gabby, just, just a few comments on the domestic market. Um, what is the exact size of the domestic market into Bali? And, um, and, 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 and do you think, um, do you think it's going to be effective in, in getting hotels back on track? What do you think they need to do to embrace it? I think from a regional perspective, Bali's in a very strong position in terms of its split between domestic and foreign guests. Up until about 2018, I think it was about two thirds 
domestic, one third foreign. Uh, last year, of course, there were a few flight price concerns and politics concerns. So I think it was around 50-50 in 2019. So there is a very strong base of domestic tourism that will keep a certain component of the Bali market bubbling away as soon as flights uh, and the water, the ferries, et cetera, start again in Bali. That's probably at a price point uh, that won't help a certain segment of the market, as Lucien mentioned a bit earlier. But as a base market, it's very strong. What, what, what do you think? Some, some people have talked about um, um, this kind of this hyper domestic market. Because there's actually a lot of um, a lot a lot of people that, that, that live in Bali. There, there's there's a large domestic um, or, or audience there. Is this something for hotels to embrace? I think what we're seeing in Western Australia as an example of what will happen uh, because people are not allowed to leave Perth. They are now travelling around Perth. So the regional areas of Margaret River are boomtown. They are year on year up. Uh, now, Bali, of course, as soon as it opens, has a massive demand base in Jakarta, in Surabaya, in Makassar, Medan, etc. Now, that comes at every price point. And if the high-end Indonesians aren't able to go to Singapore to go shopping or to Europe or to the US, then they will, by necessity, because they want to leave Jakarta, go to Bali. So I think that is a very solid market that's enormous. Uh, as soon as that wheel starts to turn, uh, I'm very positive that the domestic market will return to Bali. It's also had a very good track record over the last couple of months of keeping the infections low, et cetera, et cetera. So positive, positive. Oh, my goodness. That's excellent. It's great to hear some more positivity. Um, uh, we've got two very, very quick ones. Um, Francisca, this one's for you, please. Um, can, the, can the BHA help hotels or operators get any tax breaks? or any government support? Are you working on any initiatives like that? Just a quick answer, please. Um, it's already out, the government supports uh, for the uh, tax incentive starting period, April until September. Thank you, it's thank you. Um, excellent, it's great to hear. Bill Barnett, a few closing words, please. Okay, final, final. You know, there's actually not much I can do with Norbert and with Jesper, they gotta get happier. I mean. You know, uh, you know, these discussions are really important, getting these people together, because, you know, if you want to get to the top of a mountain, you're going to start climbing up. And that's what we're doing today. You know, we're all saying, you know, nobody here knows what the hell is going to happen. But what we're saying is, you know, we have to move our businesses ahead. We have to start the reopening process and move day by day. But COVID-19 didn't bring all of this about. COVID-19 is an accelerator of trends that were out there already. So when you look at your hotels with four staff, five staff to one room, that had to change anyway. Bali has been living in a hyper, hyper inflation uh, area for a long time. You know, this has been coming where the East becomes the new West. So what we're doing now is normalizing our hotels. So no matter if the empty is, if our hotels are empty or full going forward, we have to retweak our models. And that's what we can do now. So no matter what happens, third quarter, fourth quarter, early next year, it's time to rethink our hotel businesses and understand that Asia is just not a cheap place to do business. We have to learn to do things better, right? So Fantastic. that's the message Thank today. Thank you, Bill. There's going to be a recording for everyone. Everyone can re-listen to this and, and, uh, and, uh, and download the presentations. I want to thank everyone. Lucien, Francisca, Emily, Matt, Jesper, Vanessa, Mimi, Sean, Bill, of course. Thank you very much for joining us today. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Peace. -bye.